You will hear a variety of recordings and be asked to respond to questions based on what you hear. Time will be given to go through instructions and questions and review your answers, and each recording will only be played once. There are four parts to the test, and you will have to write your answers on sheet in 10 minutes. Let's move on to part one. Part one. First you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now we begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, as the recording is not played twice. Listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions 1 to 5. Hello, I've just moved to Melbourne for a new job and I've been advised to register with a new doctor for my family and myself. I think that this surgery is the nearest one to where I live. What's the name of the road that you live in, sir? Dawson Road. Yes, that's in our area. Would you like to register with us now? Yes, please. Right, I'll just have to take some details. First of all, could you give me your name? It's Mike Jacobs. J-A-C-O-B-S. And your family? My wife's name is Janet, and I have one little boy whose name is Rod. Ron? No, Rod. R-O-D. Good, that's fine. And what is your address here in Melbourne? 52 Dawson Road, Highfield, Melbourne. Highfield, H-I-G-H-F-I-E-L-D. Good. And I'll need to know your health card number. It's N-H-8718-12C. What about my family? Oh, only yours for now. Do you know the name of your old doctor? It was Dr Graham Mackenzie in Perth. Now, we've got four doctors here. There's Dr Susan Larkins, Dr Kevin White, Dr James Nicholson and Dr Linda Williams. Which one would you like to register with? Oh, uh, I didn't think of that. Well, I think I would like a man as my doctor. Uh, I'll go for the last one. Was that one a man? No, that was Dr Linda. How about Dr Kevin? Yes, that will be fine. Right, Dr White it is. Will that be the same for your family? Oh yes, my wife might not want a man as her doctor. Um... Well, we'll leave it as it is for now, and my wife can change if she wants to. Before the conversation continues, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen carefully and answer questions 6 to 10. I'd like to make an appointment now for my wife. She wants to come in at the end of the week. Mm, how about this Friday morning? That's Friday the 21st. Mm, I don't think she can make the morning. Any openings in the afternoon? There are appointments available at 2, 2.30 and 3.30. We'll take the first one, please. OK, that's done. Oh, and what shall my wife do if she wants to switch doctor? She can just give us a call here. Do you want to take the number down? Yes, please. It's 72539829. Can you give me your name, please? My name's Angela, but there are two other girls who might be on duty as well. Their names are Elizabeth and Rachel, but it doesn't matter who's on duty. Anyone can take care of it. Now, what do we do if we need to call out a doctor during the night? We've got a rotation system with the doctors in the area. There's a mobile number you can call and that'll get through to the doctor who's on duty. What's that number? It's 0506-759-3856. Got that. I didn't ask about any charges. Like all Australia, prescriptions have to be paid for at the chemist at the prevailing rate. Some things like vaccinations for travel and insurance report would make a standard charge for and I can give you a price list for those. 
Consultations, though, are under the National Health Service, so they'll be free. Great. Well, that's all. Thanks and goodbye. Goodbye. Here ends the part one. You have now 30 seconds to review your answers to part one. Part 2. You will hear a presentation on advice on legal matters. First you have some time to look at questions 11 to 20. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 20. Good afternoon everybody. My name is Sally Miller and I'm here to offer you some advice on legal matters whilst you are studying at this university. Happily, most international students complete their courses without running into any serious legal problems. But if you do find yourself involved in a legal dispute of any kind, ask for help. There are two options. First, contact the student's union or welfare officer. Even if they cannot help you directly, they should be able to advise you where to go for help. The second possibility is to contact the Citizens Advice Bureau in your area. You can find them in the local telephone directory. They will be able to recommend a solicitor if you need one and tell you if there is a local law center providing free legal advice. They will also be able to tell you whether you can claim legal aid to help pay for any court and legal fees. Let me give you some basic information about the police. The police have the power to stop and search anyone who appears to be behaving in a suspicious manner. If you are arrested for any reason, even if you know it to be a wrong reason, remember a few very important things. One don't be aggressive. 2. Do not try to bribe the police officer. 3. If you are arrested by plain clothes police officers, ask to see some form of identification. 4. Give your true name and address if the officer asks you to. Lying to the police is a criminal offence. 5. Do not sign any statement until you have received advice from a solicitor. There is always a solicitor on duty at every police station. 6. You will be entitled to make one telephone call. If you use this call to telephone a friend, urge your friend to contact someone from your university or from the student's union and get advice about what you should do next. If you find yourself in trouble with the police, it is very important to get professional advice. Contact any of the following. Your university welfare officer, the students union at your university, your local citizens advice bureau, a local law center. If you are found guilty of an offense, it could seriously damage your position as an international student. So be sure to ask for help as early in the process as possible. Remember, obey the local laws. The laws here may not be quite the same as in your own country. 
Here are a few examples of actions that are illegal here. It is against the law to possess offensive weapons. For example, knives, guns, chemical sprays used for personal defense, even women are not allowed to carry sprays or other deterrents to protect themselves against possible assault, except for rape alarms, possess or supply hard or soft drugs, disturb the peace. This is called disorderly conduct. This means that you can be arrested for being too noisy or rowdy. A few words about drinking. In this country, it is perfectly acceptable for adults to drink alcohol in moderate amounts. For many people, drinking is an established part of their social life. Going out for a drink is how they relax or spend time with friends. If you go to a party or visit people at home in the evening, your host will probably offer you a drink. Often a lot of university social life can revolve around drinking, especially for undergraduates. Do not be surprised if people arrange to meet in a bar or if events are held in a pub. But you are not obliged to drink alcohol if you do not want to, even if you are in a pub or at a party where everyone else is drinking. You can always ask for a non-alcoholic drink instead. And if you feel uncomfortable going to places that serve alcohol, explain this to your friends. There are lots of other places where you can meet. If you do choose to drink, remember that you should never drive a motor vehicle after drinking alcohol. It is dangerous and the police can impose serious penalties on you. Also, remember that being drunk in public is not acceptable either and the police can arrest you for it. Drugs and alcohol can cause serious problems. Let me repeat that in this country it is illegal to use drugs, except under medical supervision. But if you do use illegal drugs and you develop a problem, there are organizations you can contact. Contact your student's union or your student counselor. Anyone over 18 years old can legally buy and consume alcoholic drinks in this country. But if you think you might be drinking too much, get help and advice from your student counsellor or your doctor. Again, there are special organisations that can help you with drug and alcohol problems. Contact them. Here ends the part two. You have now 30 seconds to review your answers to part two. Part 3. You will hear a conversation between Carlos, Melissa, David and Simona. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 30. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 30. OK everyone, let's look at what presentation tips we come up with for our next seminar, Melissa. OK, here's my first tip. Show up early. Some experienced presenters say that something good is bound to happen. I'm not sure about that, but... Well, you may have a chance to head off some technical problem. Also, at the beginning, before you actually begin your presentation,
people filter in slowly. It's a great time to introduce yourself. Can't argue with that. Simona had some ideas about opening. Have a strong opening. I picked up a few ideas for structuring your opening. First, never apologize. If you're worried the presentation won't go well, keep it to yourself and give it your best shot. Besides, people are usually too preoccupied with their own problems to notice yours. I like that. Open by addressing the following three questions. What's the problem? Who cares? What's your solution? Excellent suggestion. David, you've gone quiet. Well, my next suggestion is PGP. That means that with every subtopic, you should move from the particular to the general and back to the particular. Even though the purpose of a subtopic is to convey the general information, bracing it with particulars is a good way to draw attention and promote retention. I've got another one. This might not be a tip so much as a law. Give everyone at least one piece of paper. A piece of paper is a record from your presentation. People can use that to help recall the details of the presentation, or better yet, to tell others about it. The next tip I have is uh, know your audience. This is, of course, uh, a general piece of advice for public speaking. See, if you can find out what styles of information a presentation they are most familiar and comfortable with, adapting your presentation to those styles will leave a few uh, barriers to the direct communication of your material. I like that idea. We mentioned possible technical problems before. My next point is that maybe speakers should rethink the overhead projector. Is one really necessary? I think that often is. But I agree with your basic point, Simona. Don't use one just because it's there. Maybe a good tip is to consider carefully what you're putting on your slides. Yes, David. That's a very good point to make. Slide content is, well, you don't want too much, too little. Carlos? Good point to both of you. Another point I have is to respect the audience. Don't condescend by dumbing down your lecture. Show them respect by saying what you believe and what you know to be the whole story. I also have a point about humour. I think that humour is generally good, but be careful with it. Humour in a presentation works best when it actually drives the presentation forward. If you find you're using canned jokes that don't depend on the context of the presentation, eliminate them. David? Maybe, Melissa. But always be very careful about jokes that put down a class of people. If you're going to alienate your audience, do it on the merits of your content. Also, avoid masculine or even feminine pronouns as universals. It can be a nuisance to half the audience. As universals, use the plural they. The Oxford English Dictionary has allowed they as a gender-neutral singular pronoun for years. Thanks, Simona. Thinking towards the end, take care with the questions. Many people judge the quality of your talk not by the 20 minutes of presentation, but on the 30 seconds you spend answering the question. Be sure to allow long pauses for questions. 10 seconds may seem like a long pause when you're at the front of the room, but it flows naturally from the audience's point of view. Let people know you believe your material. Speak with conviction. Believing your subject matter is one of the best ways to speak more effectively. Finish early, and something good is almost bound to happen. If nothing else happens, people will be able to leave early, and suddenly they'll have an extra couple of minutes to do things they didn't think they'd get to. People will really like you if you do that. I think we have missed the key point. Practice. Practice over and over and over. If you can, record your presentation. Play it back and watch yourself. You'll discover a thousand horrible things you never knew about yourself. Now watch it again without the sound. Why are your hands flying around like that? Now listen to it with the picture. Get rid of those ums. 
Now watch it at twice the normal speed. This emphasizes low frequency cycles in your gestures. David, those were excellent points. I have one more, something quite simple, but often overlooked. I read that the two most dehydrating things you can do in a modern civilization are live presentations and air travel. I don't know if it's really true, but the message is that the way to stay sharp is to drink a lot of water. Take care of your body, especially your voice. If possible, avoid alcohol too. Sir, we've got to organize these points now. Here ends the part three. You have now 30 seconds to review your answers to part three. Part 4. You will hear a talk on the research of the behavior of chimpanzees. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Welcome back to my series of short lectures on apes. Today we will examine recent and historical breakthroughs on the behavior of chimpanzees, otherwise known as chimps. The word chimpanzee is an umbrella term for two different species of apes in the genus Pan, which are the common chimpanzee or pan troglodytes, found in West and Central Africa, and the bonobo, or pan paniscus, which are found in the forests of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Chimpanzees belong to the hominidae family, together with gorillas, orangutans, and indeed humans. Current research tells us that the chimps broke away from the human branch of the hominidae family approximately six million years ago and remain the closest living relative to humans to this day. More modern researchers into chimpanzees have centered on their behavioral characteristics, once all biological and genetic factors have been ruled out. In this way, scientists have unearthed an unfathomable amount of similarities between human and chimpanzee behavior. Although much of this research has taken place through observation of captive chimps, the results are widely seen as an authoritative reflection of chimps living in the wild. Chimps live in large so-called communities, comprised of many male and female members, with the social hierarchy determined by an individual chimp's position and influence. Through such research, scientists have found that chimps learn and adapt through observation of others' behavior. Once in power, the alpha male is often seen to alter its body language in order to retain power. For example, he might puff himself up in order to intimidate others. While lower ranking chimps are noted to behave more submissively and holding out their hands while grunting. Female chimpanzees also have a distinct social hierarchy with high social standing inherited by children. It is not unheard of for dominant females within a community to unite and overthrow the alpha male, backing another in his place. James Diamond, in his book The Third Chimpanzee, 
suggests that chimps should now be reclassified in the genus Homo instead of Pan, and there are many arguments still in favour of this. Male common chimpanzees are, on average, 1.7 meters in height, weighing 70 kilograms, with their female counterparts being somewhat smaller. By comparison, the bonobo is slightly shorter and lighter, but with longer arms and legs. However, both species walk on all fours and climb trees with great ease. Jane Goodall made a groundbreaking discovery in 1960. When she observed the use of tools among chimpanzees, including digging for termites with large sticks, a recent study claimed to reveal that common chimpanzees in Senegal have been using spears sharpened with their teeth to hunt. However, these reports remain unsubstantiated. Researchers have witnessed such tools, namely rocks, being used by chimps to open coconut shells, and indeed crushing nuts with stone hammers. As scientific technology has developed, so too has our knowledge of the sheer extent of the chimps' intelligence. Research has now shown that chimps have the capability to learn and use symbols, and understand aspects of the human language, including syntax as well as numerical sequences. As I mentioned earlier, the umbrella term chimpanzee. Is comprised of the common chimpanzee and the bonobo. These two subspecies are divided along the Congo River, with the common chimps living on one side, and the bonobos living on the opposite side of the river. Over the past few decades, both of these subspecies have witnessed an alarming decrease in population density, with animal activists now working harder than ever to protect those remaining and encourage procreation. In addition, next week's episode will focus more closely on how chimpanzees in captivity are able to learn things through imitating the behavior of humans, as well as how chimpanzees' behaviors have developed over many generations. Thank you very much for attending this evening's lecture. I hope you found it intellectually stimulating, and I look forward to seeing you again next week. Good night. The listening module of the test is over. And you now should write your responses to the answer sheet in ten minutes.